All right, so at the end of class last time, we ended up with uh, this equation for strain. And you know, sometimes my fractions don't show up right. But obviously, any time there's one number right on top of another one, that should be a fraction. I, I don't know why those. Uh, sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't show up. Um, so we basically derived this equation, and then you know we verified that for like sigma one one we in fact get the expected answer. Right? The, and the expected answer being the one that we <coughs> derived from the geometry. Right? So now we, have, uh, now we have strain. So our strain is our sort of relationship back to displacements. And so now so we have a relationship between, from this, we go from displacements to strain. And now we're going to go from strain to stress. And then once we have that, we can plug it back into our conservation momentum equation and, and solve for the displacements. We have an equation that's completely in terms of unknown displacements that we can solve for. Okay. So uh, So just some uh, definitions. Uh, the volumetric strain is the trace of the strain tensor. So this, the trace is the sum of the diagonals. Right? It's the sum of the diagonal entry. And we call that the volumetric strain. So this is, this is sort of the total strain that goes into changing the volume of, of something. Right? So when we talk about volumetric strain, we're talking about if we have our little representative cube of material, and we squeeze it, right, and it deforms into some smaller cube of material. Sort of the difference between the larger cube and the smaller cube, that's the volumetric strain. And you know, when we talk about an, an, another word for volumetric strain is dilatation. So you might hear me say that or hear other people say that. So when you're talking about dilatation, it's, it's again, it's the change in volume of the material. Shear strains or deviatoric strains are another word for that. Shear strains don't change the volume. They, ch they only change the shape. Okay. So shear strain, I think you probably know from your mechanics class. <coughs> A shear strain would be one, and I'll just draw it in 2D. Uh, but if we were to apply some forces and deform our cube in this way. Right? So now we're starting to get into the relationship, right? Material constants are what relates stress to strain, right? So, so if we can, say, measure the strain and we know the material property, then we can figure out what the stress is, right? And uh, so we have quite a few of them. And for isotropic materials, there's relationships between all of them. But you know, let's talk about what some of these are. So, the Young's modulus, I think you know what it is. We already talked about it a little bit, but you know, the Young's modulus would be if you have a bar and you pull on it such that you're applying only a strain in one direction, right? So you only have the strain in one direction uh, and you measure the stress, then if you plot the stress in that one direction versus the strain in the one direction, you'll see a linear relationship, at least initially, and the slope of that is E, of course. And you know that we can just rewrite this equation. S11 equals E epsilon one one. So that's the Young's modulus. Uh, also sometimes you'll see it called just the elastic modulus. Uh, 
All right, so the bulk modulus is, you know, if we go back to our cube, and we apply a hydrostatic stress, I think we already defined that the, the, the hydrostatic stress is equal to, you know, if you have it's sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, the hydrostatic stress is the average of those stresses, right? So sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 over 3, or, you know, using the notation of the stress tensor, S11 plus S22 plus S33 divided by 3. Right? That divided by the dilatation or the volumetric strain is the bulk modulus, right? So, um, you know, if we well, it's, it's because it's defined as the hydrostatic stress, which is this, right, divided by the volumetric strain. So that's where the three comes from. Right, so it's, it's the hydrostatic, here, maybe this, let me just write a, <coughs> this is a hydrostatic stress divided by the bulk modulus. So um, another way to, to, to say this, to go back to Young's modulus quickly, the Young's modulus is a measure of the material's resistance to <coughs> unidirectional or one-dimensional stretching. Right? So the Young's modulus is the material's inherent resistance to stretching in one direction. Okay. The bulk modulus is the material's, you know, again, inherent resistance to hydrostatic compression. So meaning. If I squeeze from all sides, the bulk modulus is what res is, is the inherent material property that resists that. Okay. The shear modulus, um, the shear modulus is you know if we had a again a cube and we um, <coughs> deform it in pure shear. such that, you know, this is a measure of the shear strain, uh, which is equal to 2 E13, then, um, then you'd have this relationship. Right? So it's the stress you'd measure uh, divided by the strain. And again, in words, it's the resistance of the material, the inherent material property or the, the inherent material's resistance to shearing, right? So shearing is like that kind of motion. And you know, here I say for isotropic material. So for isotropic material, an isotropic material will only have one shear strain. Uh, and that's because they'll all be equal. So, you know, of course there's other shear components. There's one, two, so one, two, one, two would also be equal to G, right? And two, three, two, three would also be equal to G, okay? But you can have anisotropic materials that, you know, if you shear them in different directions, they'd have a different resistance. And in that case, you'd have multiple shear, you'd have multiple different shear moduli, okay? And uh, the Poisson ratio, the last one there, is sort of a secondary material property. Um, but, you know, if we had a bar and we pull on both ends, such that we deform the bar like this. Whenever I have a material that I, and I pull on it, it's going to naturally, if I just pull on it in one direction, it's going to shrink. It's going to shrink in the other direction, okay? It's going to shrink in the other direction. And that ratio, the ratio of, say, the, the, the amount I stretch it to the amount it shrinks, uh, is the Poisson ratio. Okay. So th this is, you know, this is 
pretty common. And it's all the Poisson ratio for all sort of natural materials is always a positive number. Um, although, you know, in man-made materials, there's a, an interest for some materials to have actually negative Poisson ratios. What does that imply, a negative Poisson ratio? Yeah, when I, when I stretch it, it, it expands. Or when I deform it, it uh, or another way that uh, I guess um, another reason these are interesting materials, they're particularly interesting for ballistics. Like imagine you had a, a bulletproof vest that when, when a bullet hit it, the material, instead of moving out of the way, you know, deforming away from the bullet, if, what if it actually got more dense? What if it moved in on itself? It would take a material with a negative Poisson ratio to do that. And that would be very good for the guy wearing the vest. Because you, know, you, you can have some lightweight material that becomes more dense as something impacts it. And so uh, it's an area of, in, in like material science, where we're trying to architect and build new materials. Uh, that's, that's one area of, of research, of trying to come up with new uh, for materials that have a, a Poisson ratio that we can design. Um, if, the, if the material has a Poisson ratio of one half, what does that imply? And if I pull on it, it shrinks by the, twice the amount I pull on it. There's a word for it. Incompressible. Yeah, it's incompressible. <coughs> so, what is the bulk modulus of a material that's incompressible? Huh? It's infinite. Yeah, it's infinity, right? So, so an infinite bulk modulus or a Poisson ratio of a half, they, they, you know, they imply one another. Right? So, you know, again, re real materials don't, most real materials don't actually achieve that state in any case, but it's a good, it's a really good approximation, so we use it sometimes. Right? It, it makes the equations simpler, and, and in, you know, in reality, it's a very, very small error in the assumption. 